So the standard changes. As I mentioned at the outset, um, 90 version, 90 reference document. I think 86 this morning, so I, I made a mistake. It's not, t not taped or anything today, is it? So um, 90 reference standards in volume two um, and 126 in volume one. I got that one right. So, and I said some element of 50% of the changes of, this, of these documents have had some element of change to the code. New additions, revisions, correction amendments, stuff pulled out, new standards incorporated, and things like that. So here's the standards of note for in terms of I'm going to talk about today. And the first one is about AS1562 part one, which is your metal roofing standard. And I did touch on this a little bit when we went through the, the, the metal roofing provisions. AS2050, the roof tiling standard. ASNZS2918, solid fuel burning devices standard. Might actually get to talk about that one here. The rest of the country, it's not, you know, <laughs> haven't been used as much when we're talking about this in Darwin. The seminar they really weren't all that interested in this standard. Um, the some of the changes to the the plumbing standards AS3500 suite, AS3700 the masonry structures standard, AS3959 the building in bushfire prone areas, and for New South Wales also about the changes to the planning for bushfire um, planning for bushfire protection, which is also, which has additional provisions um, that apply concurrently to AS3959. AS4200, um, pliable building membranes, which we've touched on a little bit. AS4859, thermal insulation for buildings. AS5113, which is a facade assembly testing standard. That's only applicable to um, type A and B buildings in class two to nine buildings. Um, I will touch on that this afternoon, but if you're interested, that just to flag it there. And changes to the 5146, which is the AAC standard. I've also noted there that um, ASNZS 3000, the wiring rules standard, has had a substantial change as well. That document's not referenced in the NCC itself, but it, um, it does, you know, as we all know, affects you know, residential buildings um, just as much as any of those other standards I've just mentioned there. We have our own, HA's produced an, um, an information sheet on all those changes, on the changes on ASNZS 3000, the wiring rules standard. If you're interested, um, as members, you'll get free access to those information sheets. Um, and if you'd like, um, you know, come and see me and we're happy to resend it out to you if you haven't received it already. There's like 200 changes to that standard, but not all are applicable to, to residential buildings. Really, your electrician should be aware of it, but some of you will be copying that as well for that, the changes to that standard. So, getting on to 1562 part one, um, there's been some changes to the design and installation requirements and the testing requirements. This standard's a bit of a, um, a unique standard in that it's really a manufacturing standard. It's not really a design and install standard. It ha does have some elements of it, but really it's different to the, the ACP provisions in volume two for metal, for metal sheeting, where this one is really about a system and talking about the tested system as a whole rather than having the individual elements of, the, of it itself. There has been some improvements to that um, to improve the, the documentation requirements for those systems, and there has been some changes to the flushing and fastening requirements. There's also been some testing requirements about the airbox test and the, um, the high-low, high-low test, which are more applicable to areas beyond N3. In terms of AS2050, um, the question on this one and was about the, and it's now incorporated requirements for steel battens, where really it was only about timber battens before. I know more and more people are using furring channels or top hats for your battens, for your battens for your roofing. And there's now provisions incorporated there for what type of battens and the fixing requirements, really taking account of what a lot of you are already doing. So are you, What's the mix at the moment using metal versus timber roof patterns for your tiles? More still timber or is it more seeing more and more? <coughs> One of the big ones for this in terms of the steel is in 2050, it has some restrictions, particularly in the edges of the roof. If you know the standard, you know what I'm doing this triangle, um, about restrictions of where you can have joins over your, um, over your trusses. So 
with with timber with shorter lengths you know having to have those more joins where the steel can give you those longer lengths and try and get you out of that restricted zone where you can't have any joins there and that was one of the changes to the standard you know that did highlight out of the riverside golf club disaster many years ago in, in adelaide where the joining or the you know the joins over the actual roof trusses themselves you know your splice joins or your your you know your staggered joins or your um you know your butt joins and your staggered nails um that there was some issues there so with having the metal it does provide that some other flexibility or design options um, i mentioned about updating of the sarking requirements for long rafter links and clarifying that um, also about clarifying the scope of the standard in the application it did say that you could use it for it was really for class one and ten buildings but it could be used for some class two three and class four parts for building um, but it didn't have those wing classification requirements, so now they've been incorporated into 2050. Um, another issue has been about mortar mixes and the use of flexible pointing as a mechanical fastening for roof tiles, and there's been some other improvements there, and that was both out of, um, again, out of that, the Cyclone Yazi and, and Larry up in, up in North Queensland, where those flexible pointing was, all became loose and those, the tiles became the, 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 the flying objects. And then some other changes um, in line with some of the other reference standards happened over the years. The ASNZS 2918, the Domestic Solid Fuel Burning Appliances Standard, um, if you're, it's really a manufacturer's standard, this one. There has been some changes there about um, untested products, about the types of fasteners you can use, um, about really this standard is about the separation requirements in many parts and testing requirements for how far your you know your solar fuel burning device or your you know your wood burning appliance needs to be off the wall or from a surrounding from surrounding materials, and then also about how the penetration through the roof and the again separation of material requirements around it. If you're using that standard, you know if if, if you're aware of it, really it's then take take note of it. But really, for a lot of it's more a manufacturing standard than necessarily a design and install standard. There's been a few changes to the plumbing standards. Um, one of the requirements in 3500 Part One is to change the requirement for installation of plastic pipes and fittings in direct sunlight. Um, changes for to include a deemed to satisfy option for vacuum drainage systems, which really is more in a commercial setting. Sounds a bit scary, doesn't it? A vacuum drainage system. For a vacuum toilet system. Um, then you've got some changes to 3500 Part 3, um, which captures siphonic drainage, which is again about more in a commercial setup. But there has been a number of changes to the roof drainage requirements and updated rainfall intensity data, which have been updated um, where the code did it a few years ago when it was putting those um, overflow from eaves gutters provisions into the code. That hadn't been updated at the time in 3500 Part 3, and that's now been updated. The next one's about 3500 Part 4, which has made some changes to the another option around the orientation of solar water heaters and, uh, PV, and you know, panels on roofs, where the 2016 code had some restrictions which limited the, the type of orientation you could have for some of that, that there, and that was causing quite a number of concerns for some of the industry. And 3500 Part 5, which was the housing installation standard, has now been removed from the code, which really that document was just a conglomeration of Parts 1 to Part 4 of 3500. So they, they decided to remove that standard. Now you need to use Parts 1, 2, 3 or 4 as, as applicable. The masonry structures standard um, AS3700, which is really a first principles design engineering standard, has had some changes um, around the con compressive strength of grouted masonry, um, the concentrated loads and durability provisions. Um, the ones I want to draw your attention to about new provisions for allowing for stack bond masonry, which is again something that people were raising with HIA that there should be deemed to satisfy solutions in the code and we brought that forward as to that stands committee. About the wall ties and accessory provisions, there's been a new appendix I added to that standard that captures those wall tie connectors and accessory and, and corrosion protection requirements 
That was spread over three different standards and was just a dog's breakfast. And now at least it's they're still in those other standards, but now it's been replicated in AS 3700 and some other changes there. In terms of bush fire, uh, construction in bushfire prone areas, there's been some changes to the testing criteria and the use of AA crib testing for products, which is really more of a manufacturing issue and allows for a greater range of products. There's been some changes to the site assessment provisions. Um, the clarification of treatment of GATS requirement, where it was, um, and there's also some, some, some tr provisions now about the protection of open subfloor spaces for bell 12.5 and bell 19 now to have need to have the same level of protection that you would need to do for a bell 29 and that applies where the subfloor timbers are within 400 mil of the ground so it will also might apply to the post it might apply to the bearer might apply to the joist and it could also apply to the flooring where it's within that 400 mil of the ground and now it's being treated the same way as what it would be for Bell 29. So a bit of a scope creep. Not a bit, quite a bit of a scope creep. Yep. There's also some protection requirements for veranda support posts in Bell 12.5 and Bell 19, which might give you some options, but using either a, you know, a shoe or using such as a, you know, a fire resistant timber post. And for weather strips for garage doors will need to meet a flammability index and not greater than five, which will apply to all bell levels. So that will be some added cost to your garage doors. Some might already be providing that, but now that um, will be applicable for um, yeah, garage doors um, in all bell zones. There's also been some changes to allow for some new building materials and technologies and some increased options for glazing and your window options. It was quite restrictive testing requirements previously, so it's included some additional glazing testing options. It now allows for translucent or transparent roof material um, in Bell 12.5 and Bell 19 for awnings and carports, which is another one of those changes that many of you have raised with us about something that should be accepted as a deemed to satisfy and bring that forward as part of the changes to the standard. It doesn't allow it where it forms part of the, the, the roof of the dwelling itself, but it's allowed for, for, for carports and for awnings. There was also some questions around the use of composite metal plastic pipes and whether they were allowed in, um, in bushfire zones. You, know, you might see some of those, those composite pipes are emerging more and more now, and it's been clarified that no, those composite pipes wouldn't be allowed. It would need to be a, a, a metal pipe in those circumstances. Those composites wouldn't be permissible. And there's also been some editorial issues and formatting to improve readability. So for those of you who work across the um, who work across jurisdictions, there's been some changes to the New South Wales planning for bushfire protection. Um, and so the site assessments must be done using the tables in the planning for bushfire protection, not AS 3959. Um, Bell 12.5 and 19 decks and verandas must be constructed to Bell 29. It's not a new provisions, but it further emphasises it. Um, grasslands, which is part of your you know, determination of your site classification, must now be included in bushfire prone land mapping. Many more rural areas, um, even without trees, may have to be considered consider ember protection and generally will be Bell 12.5 and an asset protection zone. Compliant development may only be carried out on a site rated up to Bell 29. Bell 40 and Bell FZ must always get planning approval via development application. Um, it's maybe not, um, not a change, but um, much clearer in the new version. And what we are led to understand is that the new provisions of planning for bushfire protection are supposed to take effect from 1 May in line with the NCC 2019 changes. Recently, we probably um, were advised that that may not actually happen at that time. Um, with, the with, the, with the government election recently, I think it might be that some of the legislative changes haven't all been done about this, so, um, but we haven't had that fully clarified about when it will take effect. But they're trying to align it more so with the NCC. We have produced a member information sheet on the plan for bushfire protection um, requirements and we also have done a number of seminars um, with the rural fire, New South Wales Rural Fire Service and probably might do some more. Just 
a show of hands, and this might be able to determine whether we do run some more on this one, is how many of you are building in New South Wales as well, and would it be beneficial for us to get Rural Fire Service to try and come out and do a presentation in Canberra if we can? And far south coast, yep. So a lot in the room. So, okay, we'll tr we'll we'll endeavour to do that. They've been very receptive to it so far. Um, as I said, we've got our information sheet that we've just published. Um, again, if you aren't subscribing to our website or our, getting our e-membering users and stuff like that, um, let us know and let Michelle or, or Greg know, and we'll make sure that we you're getting on these documents um, as we produce them because we're producing them for you. If you're not getting them, then that's an issue, and we need to ensure that the right information is going out to you, otherwise we're developing them for nothing. <laughs> and they take a lot of effort to develop, and we want to ensure that we're getting out to the right, the right people. So the changes to the pliable membrane standard, I won't go into lots of detail on this one, because we already had sort of talked about it in the condensation provisions, but it has been quite a substantial rewrite of the provisions and takes account of a lot of new materials and different um, climatic zones for the different materials and the different vapour permeability and things like this. Similarly, there's been some changes to AS4859, which is your material standard for thermal insulation for buildings. It's now been split into two parts. Part one, um, about the cr criteria, and about two, part two being the design and it just captures a, a broader range of products. Really for you, you just need to know, does your insulation material you're using comply with AS4859? And then you therefore can use it really. That's the main one that you need to concentrate on. And that's I mentioned earlier about the changes to AS5146, about the autoclaved <coughs> aerated panels, and now allows for the use of 50 mil or 70 mil, five mil thick AAC panels as a deemed to satisfy provision. I'm not sure how many manufacturers we have in the room today, probably not a lot by the look of it, um, but there's been a number of changes to the transitional provisions in the code. They do apply broad, more than, broadly than just manufacturers, but there's been a change, um, there's been a transitional note added about test reports based on early editions of 1530 parts one to four, that they will need to be um, updated or um, reconfirmed essentially by 1 May of 2022. So a lot of these test reports are based on uh, much old, on older versions of those standards. Not that a lot of those standards have changed over time, but um, this nearly got pulled out of the code altogether and industry said, don't do that. This is really, really difficult to get this sort of testing done in time. And just for example, the 3500 part four test, which is essentially a bit of a full room fire type of test to determine group, um, you know, some fire hazard property requirements and other things is like a twenty to thirty thousand dollar test. Not a cheap thing to do. There's only two or three test rigs in Australia can even do it. And a lot of those test rigs are already um, you know backlogged with cladding audits, with test five double one three tests and other testing going on. So um, they've given a three year window um, the ABCB to update some of these reports. Um, and th so we've been trying to encourage all manufacturers to start to do this as soon as possible rather than leave it right to the end because it's going to catch up on them quick. But there are a number of other transitional notes in the code, and these are listed in, in the, re the schedule of reference documents, such as using products, you know, when these new standards come out, and it comes to one of those questions earlier today about when a new standard gets developed or when a new standard is referenced in the code, um, about using products that might have, you know, changed, test might have been changed, or do I, does that mean that I can no longer use that product anymore? Which is, you know, these products are already on the shelf being sold and that's not the intention. What it is is to try and put these transitional notes to say, from this date, you need, need to use products, you know, products tested to previous versions are still okay, but te products tested after this one would now need to be tested to that most current version of that standard. It still doesn't change what I mentioned before about the reference in the code about the actual version of the standard, but this is some transitional notes around this, and there are quite a few of those transitional notes to take account of. Okay, so just a bit of a summary of, of the whole thing that we've been talking about this morning. So it, 
The code is a, is a significant amendment. There's a changes that will affect all classes of building. The NCC 2019 is available for preview on the ABCB website right now. Um, majority of the changes take effect from 1 May of this year, but that is subject to some transitional arrangements and where, you know, I mentioned energy efficiency changes, for instance, um, from 1 May 2020, but there's also about those transitional arrangements of where you're building the approval, you know, it's not to apply to projects that are already, you know, under construction and things like that. And Vanessa, you might might be an interesting one on that one is that transitional requirements is one of those questions com commonly comes up about when does the new version take effect um, and so it's those transitional arrangements around building approvals and other things which do vary state to state quite quite a bit 